This is a city of famous sights and famous sounds. A city of beautiful places and beautiful people. A community which is preserving its past and defining its future. From classy to eclectic, International Video Network presents Lights, Camera, Los Angeles. Located 400 miles south of San Francisco and 130 miles north of San Diego, the Los Angeles metropolitan area stretches from the white sand beaches of the Pacific Ocean some 60 miles inland to the feet of the towering San Bernardino and San Jacinto Mountains. This five-county area, which includes Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties, covers 34,000 square miles. With over 13 million residents, the population of greater Los Angeles is larger than all other U.S. states, except New York, Texas, and California. Looking at this vast urban landscape, it's hard to believe that not long ago, a visitor to this area would have found a far more pastoral scene. It is a very spacious valley, well-groomed with cottonwoods and sycamores, among which ran a beautiful river. Those were the words used by Father Juan Crespi to describe what he saw upon his arrival to California in 1769. Father Crespi was the diarist of the Portola Expedition, the first Spanish overland force to reach present-day Los Angeles. Spain established its well-known system of missions throughout California to solidify its colonial control, protect its trade routes, and to bring Christianity to the local Indians. Of the 21 California missions, two are located in Los Angeles County. The first, Mission San Gabriel Archangel, was founded in 1771 by Father Junipero Serra. Inside the mission walls, the gray-robed Franciscans made their own soap in these brick vats and tanned cattle hides for export. An aqueduct was constructed to provide the mission with water. The San Gabriel Mission soon became the wealthiest of all the California missions. In 1797, Father Fermin Laus Swain founded Mission San Fernando Rey de España. At one time, this mission's land holdings covered all of the land in the San Fernando Valley. In addition to the missions, Spain also worked to found civilian settlements. El Pueblo de Los Angeles State Historic Park curator, Jean Bruce Poole. When Felipe de Neve, who was appointed governor of the Californias, founded the Pueblo of Los Angeles in 1781, he gave it the name of El Pueblo de la Reina de Los Angeles sobre el Rio Posiuncula. That meant the town of the Queen of the Angels on the banks of the river Porciuncula. The Pueblo was founded with 44 people in 11 families, 22 men and women, and 22 children. Of the 11 families, they were all of mixed ethnic origins. Some were Spanish, some were black, and some were uh, Native Americans. The names of those original 11 families are commemorated on this plaque near Olvera Street. Olvera Street is part of the past that is preserved here in El Pueblo de Los Angeles Historic Park. In 1930, Olvera Street was renovated into what is still a bustling marketplace. Visitors can stroll the cobblestone street and buy souvenirs imported from Mexico or eat an authentic Mexican meal. Along Olvera Street is the oldest existing home in Los Angeles, the Avila Adobe. Built about 1818, this early California home contains the furnishings typical of a Pueblo family.
At the south end of Olvera Street is the plaza, which served as the town center of the young Pueblo. The one we have today is probably the third or possibly even the fourth plaza. And the present church was built between 1818 and 1822. And probably the present plaza was laid out in 1825 or thereabouts. By about 1870, Pio Pico, last governor of California under the Mexican rule, uh, sold his vast land holdings in the San Fernando Valley to build the city's first elegant hotel, the Pico House. And it was built uh, between 1869 and 70. It was the first three-story building in the city. It was altogether a very elegant place for people to stay. Next to the Pico House is the Merced Theater. That's the city's first building established for the performance of plays. It wasn't a very successful theater, but it was the first. Around the plaza, we had the fire house built, which housed the city's first fire department personnel. And before that, they were volunteers. And the fire house was the first fire house for the official uh, fire department. What I really hope is that the park will fulfill its original purpose, that of being a historic park dedicated to telling the story of the history of the growth of the Pueblo and its change into the city of today. While Pueblo Park serves as a reminder of the great impact its Hispanic founders had on the city, Nearby Chinatown provides a contrast in cultures typical of the remarkable ethnic diversity that makes up Southern California. In addition to Asia, immigrants from Europe, Africa and Latin America have played important roles in creating the rich cultural fabric of the city. Both Chinatown and Pueblo Park lie in the shadows of Los Angeles's soaring downtown skyline. Downtown Los Angeles has truly experienced a renaissance in recent years. The old joke about LA being 40 suburbs in search of a city is being made obsolete by a revitalized downtown Los Angeles that is a renewed political, cultural, and commercial center. The Los Angeles City Hall is perhaps the most recognizable city hall in the US. Built in 1928, it has been seen in countless films and television shows set in Los Angeles. The cultural capital of the city, the Music Center, is just a few blocks from City Hall on Hope Street. This $40 million complex includes the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, where the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, the Civic Light Opera, and the Joffrey Ballet perform. It is also the frequent site of the Motion Picture Academy's annual Oscar ceremonies. The Amundsen Theater features Broadway musicals and plays, while the smaller Mark Taper Forum features experimental theater as well as more conventional fare. Contemporary visual art is showcased downtown at the Museum of Contemporary Art, or MOCA. MOCA has two major exhibition facilities with changing international exhibitions of painting, sculpture, photography, film, video, performance, and environmental works. Not far to the south of downtown, just west of the Harbor Freeway, lies Exposition Park and the Los Angeles Coliseum. The Coliseum was built originally for the 1932 Olympic Games. The Summer Olympic Games made a triumphant return to Los Angeles and the Coliseum in 1984. Across South Coliseum Drive is the Sports Arena, home of the Los Angeles Clippers basketball team. North of the Coliseum, surrounding the park's beautiful rose gardens, are two of the city's finest museums. The California Museum of Science and Industry features displays of space technology and aviation while the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History houses mammal, bird, and artifact exhibits from all over the world.
Adjacent to Exposition Park is the ivy-covered campus of the University of Southern California, renowned for both its diverse educational programs and its winning sports tradition. On many occasions, USC's famed Trojan football team takes a trip up the Pasadena Freeway on New Year's Day to play in the Rose Bowl. Dedicated on December 30th, 1940, the Pasadena Freeway was the first of the city's famous freeways. It followed an old bicycle path down the dry stream bed of the Arroyo Seco between downtown Los Angeles and Pasadena. Care was taken to preserve the natural sycamore trees along the Arroyo, and the narrow roadway today is much the same as it was originally planned. Alongside the freeway on the way to Pasadena, the Heritage Square Museum offers a glimpse into Southern California's residential past. Here, some of Los Angeles' oldest Victorian homes have been gathered into a village-like setting. Heritage Square Museum was founded in 1969 by a group of citizens with the help of the Cultural Heritage Board of the City of Los Angeles in reaction to what was then almost daily destruction of Victorian-era buildings in Los Angeles they felt that there was a need to preserve that part of our history for people to be able to experience and observe. They've all been moved from various areas around Los Angeles and Pasadena and environs. It's all restored with volunteer labor. We have an average of two special events at the museum each month. We have uh, car clubs and we have uh, we had a Victorian fashion show very recently. All kinds of, of special things that, that go on and of course we always invite people to bring a picnic, spend the day and really take a, a trip back in time. It's a nice way to, to step back into a leisurely uh, way of life that, that most of us just don't have the opportunity to experience anymore. The Pasadena Freeway ends eight miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles at the southern edge of Pasadena, a city perhaps best known all over the world as the site of the Tournament of Roses Parade and home of the Rose Bowl. But there's far more to Pasadena than parades and football. Pasadena is a thriving community of over 130,000 that takes pride in preserving its rich historical heritage. Some of the old buildings here along Colorado Boulevard reflect the architecture from the early 1900s. Old Town Pasadena has undergone a recent renovation. Many of the buildings have kept their turn-of-the-century facades, while new shops and restaurants have taken residence inside. Pasadena first became popular in the early 20th century as a playground for millionaires. Vacationers escaping harsh Midwest winters came to stay in Pasadena's luxurious resort hotels and enjoy the mild climate. Many of the wealthy visitors found the area too attractive to leave and eventually built themselves lavish homes along Pasadena's wide tree-lined boulevards. Charles and Henry Green were among the first of many well-known architects to begin designing homes and commercial buildings in Pasadena. The Gamble House is one glorious example of the American craftsman style. It was designed by the Green Brothers, who pioneered this style of architecture. This historic home is now a museum open to the public. Other wealthy residents built their mansions here along Orange Grove Boulevard, including Mr. and Mrs. William Wrigley and the famous chewing gum family. The Wrigley Estate was occupied from 1914 until 1958. Today, it houses the offices of the Tournament of Roses Parade. Another wealthy resident of the Pasadena area was railroad magnate Henry Huntington. The 200-acre Huntington Estate today houses the Huntington Library, Botanical Gardens, and Art Gallery, which were opened to the public in 1928. The Huntington Art Gallery displays Sir Thomas Gainsborough's The Blue Boy and Sir Thomas Lawrence's Pinky. In the library is a vellum copy of the Gutenberg Bible and first edition works by William Shakespeare and Benjamin Franklin. The development of the Huntington Botanical Gardens began in 1904. On the grounds are the Shakespeare Garden, the Japanese Tea Garden, and one of the most complete cacti gardens to be found anywhere.
This beautiful garden setting is actually the campus of one of the nation's best known academic institutions. The prestigious California Institute of Technology has produced numerous Nobel Prize winning scientists and is among the nation's leading research institutions. Caltech scientists also staff NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Of special interest to Southern Californians is Caltech's contribution to studies in seismology and earthquake prediction. We expect to see great, a great earthquake in Southern California, in other words, a magnitude eight or so, um, every century and a half on the average. Uh, and the last one was 1857, so we're coming up onto the time period where we might see another one during our lifetime. Uh, Los Angeles is not going to fall in the ocean, that's um, unrealistic. Uh, nor is the ground going to open up and swallow people, that's, that's another common one. I'm not planning to leave. I think everywhere you live there's some problem. In Nebraska it's snow, snowfall and, and blizzards and in Florida it's hurricanes and in California it happens to be earthquakes. While most Californians dread the big one, visitors to nearby Universal Studios Hollywood can confront their fears firsthand. Thanks to the special effects magic of Hollywood, Universal Studios shakes up an 8.3 earthquake 200 times a day. I was very impressed. It uh, lives up to Universal's advanced claims. You can know you can survive an 8.3 earthquake and experience it safely, we think that uh, that has a great deal of appeal and there are a large number of people that, uh, that want to experience something like that. Universal Studios has been in the business of entertainment and illusion since 1915. That's when Carl Lemley purchased a 230-acre chicken ranch and founded the Universal Film Manufacturing Company. Back then, visitors paid 25 cents to watch silent movies being made. With the advent of talkies, noisy visitors were no longer welcome, and the tours came to an end. They were revived in 1964, however, and since then, the tour has become the third largest tourist attraction in Southern California. As many as 31,000 visitors a day get a behind-the-scenes glimpse at the world of make-believe. Universal Studios is the oldest and largest existing motion picture complex in Los Angeles, but it's not alone. Adjacent to Universal City is Burbank, probably most famous as the brunt of jokes from popular comedians. Besides being a quiet bedroom community, beautiful downtown Burbank is also the home of the Walt Disney Studios, Warner Brothers Pictures, and Columbia Pictures. Burbank is also home to NBC Television, where visitors can see the sets of some of their favorite television shows and learn the secrets of how they are made. Tour guests can experience the magic of television while flying high above the Los Angeles skyline in NBC's mini studio. The art of makeup, set, and costume designing are part of the tour, as well as America's most recognized couch and desk on the set of Johnny Carson's The Tonight Show. See the monitors up there? Monitors there for a few reasons. After the tour, many stay to watch a taping of their favorite show with the free tickets NBC offers to each tour guest. Across the Ventura Freeway from Burbank lies Griffith Park, the largest city park in the United States. Donated to the city in 1896 by Colonel Griffith J. Griffith, the park has three golf courses, 35 picnic areas, and over 50 miles of bridal trails nestled among its approximately 4,500 acres. Over 100 of those acres make up the Los Angeles Zoo. One of the major zoos in the U.S., the Los Angeles Zoo has over 2,000 mammal, bird, amphibian, and reptile exhibits. On the park's south side, high atop the Hollywood Hills, the Griffith Park Observatory and Planetarium is a great place for a view of downtown Los Angeles or a close-up look at Mars. 
The observatory and the nearby Greek theater were built with funds donated by Colonel Griffith upon his death in 1919. Each summer, the Greek theater presents a diverse series of outdoor concerts, ranging from rock and roll to the classics. Every Sunday afternoon, Griffith Park visitors are welcome to stop by the Los Angeles Live Steamers to take a free ride on these beautifully detailed model trains. There are 133 clubs like this all over the world. At the present time, we have members from Chula Vista near San Diego, from Phoenix, Arizona, from uh, uh, Oakland, the Golden Gators. We have almost 7,000 feet of track. It's always running with about eight trains normally every Sunday for the public. The scale is definitely bigger next door at another popular train exhibit in Griffith Park called Travel Town. Dozens of locomotives and train cars are on display here, including one of the famous Los Angeles trolleys of the Pacific Electric Railway Company. Perhaps the most remarkable mass transit system in its day, the big red cars whisked Angelinos at 55 miles per hour just about anywhere they wanted to go, from Newport Beach to San Fernando, and from Riverside to San Pedro. Formed in 1901, the railway was owned and operated by Henry Huntington. The rapid transit provided by the railway encouraged residential development in Venice, Redondo Beach, Long Beach, and numerous other outlying communities. By 1910, there were 600 cars carrying 225,000 passengers each day. The railway began to decline in 1920. The population of Los Angeles increased from 577,000 in 1920 to over 1,238,000 in 1930. However, riders on the LA railways failed to increase at the same rate. Automobile registrations increased five and a half times between 1919 and 1929 alone. By 1949, the red car system had closed. The original red car routes in many cases have been replaced with concrete instead of steel by LA's present freeway system. Southern California is crisscrossed by over 30 state and interstate highways, which together form the 650 miles of the LA freeway system, the most extensive in America. Although it is a popular Los Angeles pastime to complain about freeway traffic, there really is no better way to get around such a sprawling city. Rapid transit, however, is making a comeback in Los Angeles. Construction began in the late 1980s on LA's new Metro Rail subway line, which may eventually replace many of the old red car routes. From the Griffith Observatory, visitors can gaze down upon the city of dreams, Hollywood. What began as a quiet agricultural community in 1903 now boasts the highest concentration of entertainment-related attractions and business in the world. Oddly enough, Tinseltown got its start here in this barn. The Lasky Barn, where the first Hollywood full-length feature film, The Squaw Man, directed by Cecil B. DeMille, was shot, has been converted into the Hollywood Studio Museum, which offers visitors a glimpse into the birth of California's filmmaking industry. In 1979, Paramount donated this famous landmark to the city of Hollywood, and in February of 1983, the barn was moved to its present site and made into a museum. The barn houses Hollywood's past with a collection of old movie-making equipment and a detailed history of Hollywood's beginnings. Across the street from the museum is the Hollywood Bowl. This natural amphitheater in the Hollywood Hills is home to the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, as well as jazz and pop music festivals during the warm evenings of summer. Not far from the bowl is downtown Hollywood, the symbol of glamour and glitz that lures millions of tourists from all over the world. Hollywood Boulevard's Walk of Fame is a major attraction, with almost 2,000 stars immortalized on the most famous sidewalk in the world. This star-studded boulevard is lined with several other legendary landmarks. Perhaps the most famous is Man's Chinese Theater. This unique theater was built by Sid Grauman in 1929 as a showplace for premiering new movies. But the Chinese Theater is probably best known for the hand and footprints of hundreds of stars that are embedded in the cement in front of the theater. Today, tourists compare their hand and footprints with the celebrities who have forever left their mark. Hollywood Boulevard is crowded with many souvenir shops and tour companies. 
For shoppers seeking more of the offbeat, West Hollywood's Melrose Avenue with its trendy boutiques and restaurants is the place to shop for tomorrow's fads today. Melrose, shoppers can browse for fashions ranging from punk to chic, or dine on anything from hamburgers to sushi to California cuisine. This remarkable street often sets the trends for all of Southern California. Not far to the west is perhaps the ultimate shopping experience in Southern California, the city of Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills bills itself as the most famous small city in the world. And who can argue? Beverly Hills is not just a city. For many people around the world, this 5.6 square mile area represents a dream, a fantasy. Palatial estates, glamorous shops, extravagant cars. In a word, Beverly Hills equals luxury. Since 1912, the Beverly Hills Hotel has provided its guests with world-class accommodations. This gracious pink stucco landmark is also home to the celebrated Polo Lounge restaurant. Another luxurious accommodation and landmark is the elegant Regent Beverly Wilshire Hotel, built in 1926. From the Beverly Wilshire, one can walk across the street to the window shopper's paradise, Rodeo Drive. On this three-block stretch between Wilshire and Santa Monica Boulevards are found some of the most exclusive and, of course, expensive shops on the planet. The phenomenon of Rodeo Drive may be said to have started 25 years ago with the opening of Fred Heyman's Giorgio Boutique. That store, famous for its yellow and white stripes, is now simply called Fred Heyman. From its crystal chandeliers and cappuccino bar to its new designer fragrance 273, Fred Heyman sells what Rodeo Drive is all about, luxury. Many of the tourists walking along Rodeo Drive no doubt are keeping their eyes peeled for a movie star or two. And while they may not see Kirk Douglas walking his dog, or Peter Falk script in hand on his way to work, they can see many of the homes in which the stars live simply by purchasing a map to the movie star's homes. These maps direct tourists down palm-lined streets to the homes of Jimmy Stewart, Gene Kelly, Smokey Robinson, George Burns, and the late Jack Benny and Lucille Ball. Visitors to Los Angeles can learn more about the film industry by visiting the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, located on Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Rick Robertson, executive administrator for the Academy, explains this famous organization's mission. The Academy was founded in 1927 by a group of, of industry leaders. One of its first orders of business, um, which remains today its most visible, was the uh, recognition of excellent achievement in movie making. That award has become known as the Oscar, which is the statuette. The actual Oscar is, stands about 13 inches tall, plated in gold, and the subject of, of a great deal of mythology. and. Uh, a lot of people ask us how he got his name. A woman named Margaret Herrick, who, 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 uh, now, whose name now adorns our library and who was later to become an executive director of the Academy, it is said that she, upon first seeing the Oscar statuette, said, why, he looks just like my Uncle Oscar. Now, uh, you can believe that if you want. We're not, we're not real sure, but uh, uh, Oscar, the name Oscar has stuck. Serious students of film, as well as industry professionals, are provided access to the Academy's Margaret Herrick Library, which houses a priceless collection of scripts, artwork, and other materials documenting the history of movie making. Academy librarian Linda Marr shares a few of its treasures. Because our holdings include things like screenplays uh, from as many films as we can get our hands on, 
They include photographs, five million photographs, uh, a nice collection from all of the major productions and many minor ones, both American productions and those from abroad. One of the m oldest items in our collection is this very rare book, The Attitudes of Animals in Motion by Edward Mybridge, who did the famous study documenting whether a horse actually had uh, four feet off the ground when it was running. The Margaret Herrick Library, we like to think, is perhaps the finest, certainly one of the finest, motion picture reference research libraries in the world. Art treasures of a different kind can be found at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, also located on Wilshire Boulevard in the Miracle Mile District of Los Angeles. The museum has one of the most comprehensive art collections in the world, containing a vast variety of styles, medias, and periods. The recently constructed 100,000 square foot Robert O. Anderson Gallery houses the museum's collection of 20th century art. Located adjacent to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art is popular Hancock Park. Hungry executives from the office buildings along Wilshire Boulevard find the park a pleasant place to take a lunchtime break. The park is also home to the La Brea Tar Pits and George C. Page Museum. The Rancho La Brea Tar Pits have yielded to scientists the richest cache of Ice Age fossils found in the world. Over 100 tons of fossilized bones have been recovered from these pools of sticky tar. The George C. Page Museum of La Brea Discoveries showcases outstanding examples of the one million mammal and bird fossils recovered from the Rancho La Brea site. Reconstructed skeletons of extinct mammoths and saber-toothed tigers are on display. Also on display is an animated replica of a woolly mammoth that children take delight in seeing. Close by the museums at 3rd and Fairfax in the Fairfax District of Los Angeles is Farmer's Market, a popular meeting place for visiting tourists, lunching executives, and neighborhood senior citizens. What began as a small group of produce stalls in a vacant lot during the height of the Depression has become an attractive open-air marketplace featuring 160 independently owned and operated businesses. The colorful displays of produce, prepared foods, clothing, and souvenirs offer a tempting invitation to touch, taste, smell, and enjoy the unique abundance of the market. The traditional atmosphere of Farmer's Market contrasts with the youthful energy of Westwood Village in West Los Angeles. The village is known for its many movie theaters, restaurants, and shops. It's a delightful place to walk on a balmy summer evening. Much of the vitality of Westwood Village is provided by students from the nearby campus of UCLA. Encompassing 411 acres, the University of California at Los Angeles is one of the leading public institutions of higher learning in the West. Among its services to the greater Los Angeles community are its medical center, fine art galleries, and diverse concert programs. When students here get tired of studying, they can head a few miles down Sunset Boulevard to the beach. The sunny Southern California beaches draw a large number of tourists as well as native Californians year-round. With over 70 miles of white sand overlooking the Blue Pacific, it's no wonder that the beaches of L.A. County are one of the biggest attractions to out-of-town visitors. For surfing, Surfrider State Beach, also known as Malibu Beach, attracts local Californians because of its consistently good surfing conditions. And it's kind of consistent here. Pretty much comes in every day, about like this or more. 
Or last week. <laughs> Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello depicted the beach as a teenager's paradise in the 60s. Decades later, the music has changed, but the beach party still goes on. The Beach of the Stars, Malibu, is at the northern end of the Santa Monica Bay. This narrow strip of pristine coastline situated between the ocean and the Santa Monica Mountains has some of the most expensive real estate in the country. Home prices here are in the millions of dollars, and many of the residents are celebrities from television and film. Further down the coast from Malibu lie the palm tree-lined streets of Santa Monica. The Santa Monica Pier is a famous weekend place to bring the family and enjoy the food and games that line this historic wooden walkway. Visitors can stroll through the many shops and be entertained by the street performers that frequent the pier. Santa Monica is also the starting point of the South Bay Bicycle Trail. This paved trail winds its way south through some of the most beautiful and some of the strangest beaches in Southern California. Have you had any nightmares lately? Well, come and see Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Venice Beach is a constant show, featuring sidewalk entertainers and other colorful characters that provide entertainment throughout the day. I know, I got a big head <laughs> As one pedals south, the bike path takes a turn inland through Marina del Rey. With over 6,000 pleasure boats of all sizes, Marina del Rey is the largest man-made marina in the country. On any given weekend, hundreds of boats glide along the marina's waters. The 19-mile-long bike path ends dramatically at the cliffs of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. High over the ocean, the peninsula offers magnificent vistas of crashing surf and setting sun. In the distance lies Santa Catalina Island, the most popular of the string of eight islands that stand sentry to California's southern coast. Only two hours by boat from the mainland, the harbor at Avalon provides a Mediterranean-style destination for weekend ocean cruisers. Dotted with secluded coves that provide local boaters with scenic anchorage, this picturesque island also offers the landbound visitors such vigorous entertainment as golfing, tennis, and parasailing. Not to mention fine dining and shopping. Visitors may also tour the famous casino or take a ride on the glass bottom boats. Getting to Catalina can be accomplished by helicopter or by the Catalina Express. Boats leave daily from many of the coastal towns. If these ships seem a bit small, take a short trip across the St. Vincent Thomas Bridge to see one of the largest passenger liners ever built. The Queen Mary sits proudly in the waters of Long Beach Harbor. Christened in the 1940s, the Queen Mary made hundreds of voyages across the Atlantic before it was purchased by the city of Long Beach and put on display. Once the vessel for aristocrats in its early years, the Queen Mary was commissioned to transport troops home during World War II. Now at its permanent berth in Long Beach, the Queen Mary is open for tours and is host to waterfront restaurants. To experience its true grandeur, Guests may spend a romantic night in one of the original passenger rooms aboard this floating hotel. From the largest passenger ship, it's only a few steps to the largest airplane ever built. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. 
And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. Billionaire Howard Hughes designed and built the 200-ton Spruce Goose, whose tail section stands more than eight stories high and whose wingspan is longer than a football field. The Great Plane, which takes its name from the spruce plywood from which it is constructed, flew only once on November 2, 1947. Today, it is housed in this giant white dome where visitors can witness this great bird in all her glory. Across the channel from the Queen Mary and Spruce Goose lies California's fifth largest city, Long Beach. Late in the 19th century, Long Beach was a popular seaside resort with its five and a half mile stretch of sandy white shoreline. Now, tourists flock to the city by the sea for more than its long stretch of sand. One weekend a year, the city's streets are transformed into a challenging race course. The Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach attracts experienced race car drivers from around the world to take on this exciting course. Over the last 15 years, more than 2.5 million people have attended this racing spectacular and witnessed some memorable battles between legendary names like Andretti, Unser, Fittipaldi, Sullivan, Lauda, Villanueva, and Mears. For a slower pace, take a trip down the Orange County coast to Newport Beach. This tranquil seaside community is a lovely place to spend an afternoon flying a kite. Or browsing through its many quaint shops. Newport's Harbor is lined with over 9,000 pleasure boats for weekend sailors returning from Catalina or tourists out for an hour cruise. It's smooth sailing through the protected waters of this exclusive anchorage. Across the harbor is the neighboring beach community of Balboa Peninsula and Island. The island is accessible by bridge or by the ferries that have crossed the still waters of the harbor for decades. Ferry service started back in 1909 as a convenient way to cross the channel and cut six and a half miles off the driving time from the mainland. A trip on the ferry also offers a scenic view of the harbor and the restored Balboa Pavilion. During the Big Band era, the pavilion hosted the likes of Count Basie, Benny Goodman, and Stan Kenton. For a more detailed tour, the Pavilion Queen offers a narrated cruise of the harbor each day during the summer. For the visitor with a yearning for the sea, modern, comfortable sport fishing boats, whale watching cruises from December through February, and steamers to Catalina Island are all available at the harbor. Balboa has one of the last remaining seaside amusement parks in Southern California. Take a ride high above the water on a Ferris wheel or enjoy the other attractions this seaside fun zone has to offer. Many Southern Californians have spent the wee hours of the morning trying their luck at fishing off the Balboa and Newport piers. While the change in seasons is a subtle one in Southern California, each time of the year offers its own unique form of recreational activity. Not far from the crashing waves of the Pacific rise the majestic San Bernardino and San Gorgonio mountain ranges. When winter dusts these local mountains with snow, nearly a dozen ski areas spring to life, like Snow Summit. During the winter months, Southern Californians are lured away from their swimming pools and beaches with the promise of an exhilarating run down a challenging mountain slope. At certain times of the year, it is literally possible to spend the morning sunning at the beach and the same afternoon skiing down a Southern California mountain. 
Ironically, amidst all this beauty and splendor, the most visited mountain in Southern California isn't a mountain at all. Six Flags Magic Mountain is located on the northern border of Los Angeles County in the community of Valencia. Over three million guests a year visit the 260 lushly landscaped acres of fun and thrills. Magic Mountain offers visitors over 100 rides, live shows, and adventures for all ages. The park is best known for its unique rides, four of which are roller coasters. It also has some of the splashiest rides to cool down a hot summer day. There are many other types of rides and attractions for the whole family. Another amusement park well known to Southern Californians started out as a roadside berry stand in the Orange County community of Buena Park. In 1920, Walter Knott, along with his cousin, operated the berry stand on Highway 39, which at that time was just a two-lane country road. By 1927, Knott became the sole owner of an adjacent 10-acre berry field, as well as the popular berry stand. The next year, Knott replaced the stand with a market, nursery, and tea room. In 1932, Knott found some unusual vines that had been planted in a nearby orange grove. The vines were developed by Rudolf Boysen from a combination of loganberries, blackberries, and red raspberries. Knott took these berries and named them boysenberries in honor of their developer. Mrs. Knott made delicious preserves and pies from these boysenberries that have since become the trademark of Knott's Berry Farm. In 1934, Mrs. Knott began to prepare chicken dinners that she served to guests in her dining room. It wasn't long before her tasty dinners became famous throughout the Southland. To entertain customers as they waited, Mr. Knott moved an old hotel from Prescott, Arizona and began to build a replica of a ghost town. Other buildings were gradually added to give the town an authentic look. Today, visitors still wander the streets of the original ghost town, but also now enjoy dozens of exciting rides and other attractions. Ten minutes south of Knott's Berry Farm in the city of Anaheim is the granddaddy of Southern California tourist attractions, Disneyland. Opened in 1952, Disneyland delights visitors from all over the world 365 days a year. Guests staying at the Disneyland Hotel can ride the monorail to and around the Magic Kingdom. Just as Disneyland has grown, so have the city of Anaheim and Orange County. In fact, Orange County is one of the fastest growing urban areas in the United States. This incredible growth is even more remarkable since much of Southern California's lush expanse would actually be an arid desert if not for the engineering expertise of William Mulholland. Amidst much controversy and scandal, William Mulholland supervised the construction of the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which brought desperately needed water from the snow-capped peaks of the Sierra Nevada to the booming city of Los Angeles. Opening day ceremonies saw anxious crowds awaiting the arrival of thousands of gallons of Northern California water. Since that day, the aqueduct has been pumping life-giving water to millions of Southern Californians. Why do so many people still migrate to Southern California after all these years? There is so much here, you know, there's so much to see and do and um, the climate is marvelous. I think it's a very central city, a lot of, of exciting vibrations 
good and bad vibrations, but um, you have the impression this 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 town is alive. That's my experience. The weather, it's the sport, it's the people, it's the fun things to do around here. The sunshine, able to uh, work out, um, good healthy lifestyle, and. Uh, just having a good time, being free-spirited. so much to see. Every place you look, there's just something different. My favorite thing about LA is the beach. The beach. The guys. The beach is the, the weather. The guys. The, the guys. The guys. It's the absolute best thing. All the gorgeous men. It's all just good. It's okay. It's very nice. There's a lot of crazy people around, especially me, but uh, if you don't have crazy people, you don't have normal people, <laughs> you know. Throughout its history, one of Southern California's biggest draws is its marvelous weather. Publicized in the late 1800s as the place to come to escape the harsh winters of the Midwest and Northeast, people came the world over to bask in the warm Southern California sunshine. Winter days are usually in the 60s or 70s, with summer highs usually in the high 80s to mid 90s. However, there is a negative side to Los Angeles' sunny weather. I guess the smog. The smog. Yeah, I was just going to say the smog, smog and the smog. traffic. Pollution. <laughs> people. There's too many people now. Traffic. And, the, and the, you know, the, the smog. Traffic. Smog. Because of the surrounding mountains, local wind patterns, and ironically, the sunny weather, an atmospheric condition called an inversion often traps and holds smoke and haze in the Los Angeles basin. And even though air quality has actually improved in the past decade, there are still days when Los Angeles is shrouded in a brown haze. Even though the rest of the country jokes about LA's smog, Southern Californians are still content to live in a climate where shorts and t-shirts are almost always appropriate attire, no matter what time of year. Whether to make a new home or simply to visit, every year thousands of people from all over the world are drawn to Los Angeles. With its magnetic combination of climate, culture, and commercial vigor, Southern California remains more popular than ever. And why not? There's nowhere else on Earth where one can surf the perfect wave. Indulge in world-class cuisine. Rub elbows with the stars. Or simply relax and enjoy the unique Southern California lifestyle of Los Angeles.